For most of history, the existence of God has been treated as beyond the reach of science, not because it was proven or disproven, but because it was defined as out of range, eternal, immaterial, and untouched by the tools of observation. Where science asks for evidence, religion offers faith, and in that framing, the two have seemed to live in separate worlds. Faith, classically, is belief without justification. It is believed because it feels true, or is held to be revealed, or simply necessary to believe, but without justification. But here's the problem. That is also the definition of superstition. Belief without justification. The difference, if there is one, may lie more in social approval than substance. Faith is what we admire, superstition is what we dismiss. But what if we could pose a test, not to prove God false, but to ask, is there anything that, if true, would contradict the traditional idea of God? If the answer is yes, if that test could exist, then God would move out of the realm of superstition and properly into the realm of science and reason by way of the laboratory. But here's the twist. Theology itself may offer a way to test its own boundaries if it's willing to take its claim seriously. Classical theism defines God as eternal and everything else is created. God exists outside of time, without beginning or end, and is not dependent on anything. Everything else, the universe, our minds, even time itself, is created. That's the core distinction, the eternal versus the temporal, the created versus the uncreated. In some models, there's a caveat. God's thoughts may also be eternal, though still contingent on God. That is, they are not created in time, but they exist necessarily in God, like the structure of mathematics might exist in a mind. But outside of that divine exception, the universe is finite. Time had a beginning. Everything not God is not eternal. And this gives us something precious, a falsification criterion. If anything in reality behaves like an eternal, uncreated object, then either it belongs to God, or the claim only God is eternal fails. For the first time, different models of God can be tested to see which are compatible with science and which quietly fail when measured against it. As it turns out, not all gods survive the lab. But science has its own eternal players, and this places a falsification criterion on God's existence. In 2013, Ekaterina Moreva and colleagues showed time can emerge from entanglement, even when the total system is timeless. Inside, change is experienced. Outside, nothing moves. Eternity is not excluded from physics. It's embedded in it. The Wheeler-DeWitt equation goes further. The universal wave function drops the time variable entirely. It does not evolve. It simply exists outside of time and is therefore eternal. Entanglement itself also exists outside space-time, since relativity forbids faster than light signaling. Correlations are timeless, which means physics already describes structures that are, in the strict sense, eternal. Which brings us to a dilemma. If eternal things exist in physics, they are either God or God's thoughts, or they violate the very boundary that theism sets between the divine and the created. And if they do that, then the test has already been run, and the result is waiting. In theism, only two categories can be eternal, God himself and God's thoughts. Everything else is created. So if physics discovers eternal structures independent of God, theism is falsified. But if these timeless entities are God or God's thoughts, then theology must expand to include them. And the sacred has already entered the lab. So which is it? Are these eternal entities God? Are they God's thoughts? Or has science already falsified God? Given these scientific facts, the law of the excluded middle prevents any fourth option from existing. However, if these eternal entities, like the universal wave function, entangled quantum states, and Hilbert space structures are God, or God's thoughts, then they must be mental in nature. That is the thesis of quantum cognition that mental processes follow quantum dynamics. If God exists, then quantum cognition must be true. If it is false, then God's model collapses with it. That's exactly the thesis of a literal interpretation of quantum cognition, a field of study that proposes mental processes like decision-making, memory, and perception follow quantum dynamics rather than classical logic. Superposition, interference, contextuality, all core features of quantum mechanics have analogs in how thought behaves. In this view, the mind doesn't simulate quantum behavior, it is quantum, and mental states, such as thoughts, 
are equated with quantum states. So if God's thoughts are these eternal quantum states, then quantum cognition is a necessary consequence of God's existence. If God exists, quantum cognition must be true. If it is false, and the opposite follows just as cleanly. If quantum cognition is false, and these structures are not mental, then the idea of God's thoughts existing as timeless wave functions collapses, and so does God's existence with it. However, modern physics also shows that space-time emerges from correlations between quantum states and Hilbert space. If those states are mental, then space-time itself emerges from quantum cognition. This framework is called quantum idealism, and it treats space-time as a kind of quantum computer simulation in God's mind. However, as it is an automatic consequence of quantum cognition, when applied to our current understanding of physics, God does not and cannot exist if it is false. If true, though, it is the necessary precondition for all theism, and therefore for every religious claim as well. Thus, if anything is called God, it must fit within this rubric of quantum idealism, or science has already judged it as falsified. But here's the question. How do we translate any of this into actual religious claims? Up to this point, we've been talking about abstract physics, wave functions, Hilbert space, entanglement. It's precise. It's technical. But how do we take this and connect it to theology, to the language of God? Surprisingly, there is a kind of Rosetta Stone linking the two. In fact, there's one religious tradition whose entire cosmology already looks exactly like the picture of the universe we've just outlined. A system that claims reality is mental, that the cosmos is essentially a kind of mental projection within the divine, and that space and time emerge from a kind of inner mental world. And that tradition is Hermeticism, the ancient Egyptian occult science attributed in tradition to Hermes Trismegistus. In 2018, Ethan and Olivia Palmer published The Quantum Hermetica, showing how Hermeticism can be reverse engineered directly in a technical and precise manner from the same quantum idealist framework. Their book cites 163 scientific references, demonstrating that Hermetic principles are not metaphorical, but structural equivalents of modern physics, even duplicating oddly specific properties of the wave function and space-time's emergence that were only discovered in the 21st century. Here, for example, the popular YouTuber Inspiring Philosophy uses the same exact physics model as described in the Quantum Hermetica to illustrate the core axiom of Hermeticism, the Hermetic principle of correspondence. The scientific evidence points to the fact that space, time, and matter are emergent from the wave function in Hilbert space. In the inner world of consciousness and mind can be modeled as Hilbert space in the study of quantum cognition. Add on the evidence for quantum mind theory, and the most parsimonious explanation is space-time emerges from a shared inner mental world governed by a universal mind. As illustrated in this short clip, outer space emerges from inner space and therefore corresponds to it, or as the old hermetic adage summarizing the principle goes, as within, so without. When this framework is interpolated into Kabbalah, the authors even show how an exact 22-level block sphere representation of a qubit is produced, demonstrating an uncannily precise replication of the physics. In other words, Hermeticism is not mystical metaphor. It is a religious system directly derived from quantum idealism. So what does all of this mean for religion? Well, it turns out that the concepts found in Hermeticism map not only to physics, but also to religious concepts. For example, religious doctrines we often take for granted as moral or cultural actually have roots in this occult metaphysical tradition that can in turn be replicated from this quantum idealist framework. This provides an objective bridge between them allowing us to judge religious doctrine as either true or false, and not from a standard of either superstition or faith either, but from an objective scientific framework that is not reliant on superstitious thinking. Take the religious concepts around marriage. At the surface, these appear as social or covenantal traditions, but their deeper origin lies in the hermetic concept of the androgyne and its relation to the principle of gender a concept which neatly matches both the emanationist concepts found in systems like Neoplatonism, but which is also directly entailed by the combination theorem of the quantum idealist model known as conscious realism, derived by Donald Hoffman. Or consider the religious concept of the fallen state, seen not only in the Abrahamic religions, but paralleled in other religions as well. The direct analog of this on quantum idealism is what NASA physicist Tom Campbell refers to as entropic consciousness, which just so happens to have direct equivalence in the hermetic metaphysical system, reverse engineered into hard physics in the Palmer's book. These are not isolated parallels. They show that core religious ideas are downstream from hermetic principles, which are themselves directly derivable from quantum idealism. 
However, since quantum idealism is the only non-falsified model of God, it survives where others fail. What this means is simple, but revolutionary. Religion is now falsifiable. We now have a way to measure and judge religion not by blind faith, but by correspondence to the underlying structure of reality itself. For the first time in history, we can test theological systems the same way we test scientific models. If a doctrine corresponds to the quantum idealist framework, it survives. If it contradicts it, it fails. This hermetic metaphysical system, being reverse engineered from physics-based idealism, provides the Rosetta Stone between physics and theology, so that the claims of theology can be translated and measured. In this way, God is no longer a matter of blind faith or untouchable mystery. God is now subject to the same standards of truth as every other field of knowledge. Religion has entered the laboratory. What this gives us is a transformation. Theology itself moves from being a proto-science, like alchemy and astrology in the Dark Ages, into a discipline that can finally be treated as a true science, realizing the centuries-old dream of the great hermetic thinkers of the Renaissance, such as Marsilio Ficino, Giordano Bruno, John Dee, and Isaac Newton. Just as alchemy matured into chemistry and astrology gave way to astronomy, theology can now step forward into the Enlightenment and take its place as a field governed by evidence, structure, and reason. With quantum idealism and its bridge with the hermetic metaphysical system, all theologies and the gods of all religions can now be judged with the objective standards of science and reason. Doctrines that once rested only on faith, tradition, or authority can now be tested against the deepest fabric of reality. What survives will be what corresponds to truth. What fails is falsified by science. And so, the age of blind faith gives way to the age of measured reason. The gods of all religions stand before the laboratory bench, and theology at last becomes a science. If you like this video, subscribe and support me on Patreon. And don't forget to check out the books in my Alaris novel series, Alaris, The Lances of Light, and Alaris, The Pearl of Heaven on Amazon Kindle in the description below. You can find us on Facebook as well, at Idealism and Science vs. Atheism.